Hi, my name is Bernardo Coco with the um, Knowledge Management Innovation Team in UNDP. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Kit here today with us. She's making the time to uh, taking us through some. Have a, have a seat. Um, to take us through some of the uh, exciting methodology and work that we do at MindLab. It's also excellent to see a lot of faces um, around the table. Some of us, some of you are colleagues in UNDP. That's great. And some of you are from different agencies or. Uh, uh, outside partnerships, so that's that's um, all the more important to us. Um, one of the things that I'm, and we've got about eight people connected on Google Hangouts, is that correct? That's fantastic. Thanks, Raquel, for uh, taking care of that uh, aspect. One of the things I'm looking forward to hearing today from, from Kit, and we had a good chance last week to sit with her, and she gave us a really good rundown um, of, of the methodologies they employ. One of the things that's really exciting to me is that we get to demystify a little bit what a innovation lab is, uh, to, to some extent. It's something we, uh, we we use a lot of, sort of terminology. We have an innovation facility within UNDP, uh, and, and many of my colleagues are here. And, um, and what we do through that is we resource, we support a lot of this experimenting at country level, including through uh, innovation labs. And I think today we'll hear a lot of the learning that uh, could really help us um, uh, continue to shape that proposition as we work with government partners uh, in particular. So it's going to be, uh, we're going to hear about uh, how they, they look at a service line, public service type uh, provision, and how to go through a process that uh, hinges around the knowledge uh, element, the analysis, the synthesis, and the creation element to try and redesign some of the services um, that governments provide to their, uh, to their citizens. Uh, incidentally, a lot of this has to do with sort of silo breaking, and, and that's, we know it's an important element within the UN, certainly within UNDP sometimes, uh, to be able to look at different issues, breaking down, and, and see how different parts of the house can contribute to a solution. So there's some important learning there, I am sure, um, and particularly as we go into designing programs uh, next year. So without further ado, I'll, I'll turn over to you, Kit. Thanks again, and, and we look forward uh, to this. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I see some familiar faces around this table, and Jennifer here suggested me doing a little quiz Oops. to see if those of you who've heard this before can actually remember it. But I won't do that, so let's uh, let's just uh, get going. And also, welcome to the people on Google Hangouts. Um, <laughs> okay, um, my name is Kit and I'm the Deputy Director at MindLab, uh, a small uh, innovation unit uh, within the government administration uh, in Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, working with uh, mainly uh, our funding partners, uh, which are the Ministry of uh, Education, the Ministry of Business and Growth, and uh, the Ministry of Employment and one of the larger municipalities uh, in Denmark called Odense. Uh, the municipality has come on board uh, three years ago um, because we consciously wanted to broaden the scope from being cross-ministerial to also being uh, cross-public sector. We needed that front level uh, in our work. MindLab uh, has existed since uh, 2002 uh, in different forms. From two to uh, six, it was uh, an internal unit within one ministry, like uh, a greenhouse for projects, a creative space. And then it was transformed, redesigned to being this uh, cross-ministerial uh, collaboration to break down the silos between ministries with a lot of law in common, and also to take on um, the citizens' uh, perspective on service making and policy making. Because when you take on the eyes of citizens when uh, designing services and also policies, even reforms, then it becomes a completely different look than if you design it for the benefit of mainly the system. So those uh, two main factors, silo breaking and the perspective of the citizens, was our point of departure. When we started out uh, with this perspective uh, early on seven. Uh, we didn't have a lot to stand on. We didn't have a lot of good examples. We mainly had the good promise of it because not a lot of people work this way within the public sector. Uh, it was 
very upcoming in the private sector, where amongst others, uh, American IDEO worked with it uh, in terms of uh, improving products. But uh, looking at services, it was rather new. So we had to uh, to experiment a lot and to also learn as we went along. And um, I'll also talk a bit about how uh, our journey has been, because we're not doing exactly the same today as when we started. We say that we work with our owners to achieve the change that they want, and we do it by co-creating solutions with citizens, with businesses, and the public sector system. More specifically, uh, we, um, we have two main approaches in our work. One is the ethnographic approach, doing qualitative research with citizens to learn about their lives, to get, get, get a more in-depth knowledge about uh, what people's lives look like with current solutions, uh, eventually with new solutions, and to also uh, test elements of solutions with citizens before implementing. Then we have what we call the design approach, that means to us that we need to um, get the very abstract civil uh, service discussion to a more tangible level using, for instance, physical uh, or visual tools so that we learn to speak the same language in a very specific way. So it's also about breaking down uh, the, the services and the discussions into something that we can actually discuss from um, with different stakeholders in the processes. And then, of course, designers would never bring anything to market without testing it first. So this we've taken from the design. So this is uh, our uh, skill set model, and we have been recruiting from this from the very beginning, and we actually still do. So it's about bringing in these competences into the public sector system, these new or rather new competences, also, of course, having some of the more traditional ones, like, for instance, political science, uh, with us to understand the systems and the procedures that we are navigating in, in such large systems uh, as the one we're talking about. More about design, because this is what we mostly get questions about. Design can have so many definitions, and this one is one of them, that it's a way of questioning basic assumptions every time uh, we start on something, which also means becoming better at understanding what the problem is. One of the major uh, challenges within the public sector, and my guess is also within an organization like the UNDP, is actually nailing the right problem before we get going at it. Um, the ethnographic approach can help us uh, do this, to understand what is the problem. Because we know so much about citizens already, at least we do in Denmark. We have statistics, we have numbers, we have all the analysis, so we have a lot of knowledge in the system. And we are not looking to replace this knowledge, we're looking to broaden the knowledge so that we actually have uh, the right problem at hand before we start. Um, Ethnography, per se, is uh, talking to not so many people as if you are doing a survey. It's uh, fewer people, but it's more in-depth. It's about doing interviews, and it's about observing. And the observing comes into the picture to actually um, also get a sense of the differences between what people say they do, for instance, in, in a survey, and what they actually do. Uh, being uh, humans, we know that there can be a difference between the two. This is our space. Um, and we do have a, a rather nice space. Uh, some of you have actually been there last year. Um, the space is not a necessity, but the space is a very nice thing to have being this uh, silo-breaking institution, because we actually need a neutral ground for people to meet at when they need to discuss something that uh, um, involves more than one part. And if you take on the citizen's perspective, then almost always there will be more than one part in, in the solution. 
citizens uh, are not really uh, the ones being very interested in what agency, institution, etc. Uh, have the solution uh, as a responsibility. They they just want the best service. I have, I'm having some trouble with this. So this you probably know. It's not even only in, in the public sector that we have these main challenges: time, budgets, and complexity. Um, and of course, uh, how many resources we spend on defining problems and, and, and coming up with solutions is of course important in terms of time and, and money. Uh, and our main argument to uh, spend money and time on doing, uh, on taking on this approach as well, is that we are actually more likely to hit target in the first time because we have tested uh, the solutions before we implement them, and we don't have to. Uh, redo them uh, to the same extent. The complexity question is really important because that's also back to the um, to the problem with defining the right problem. We have different bottom lines in the public sector than we do in the private sector. It's not only about money. It's not only about the uh, <coughs> It can be about any one of these bottom lines and maybe uh, more of them at the same time. So one of the um, most important factors to me is to uh, you, to consciously pick and know what bottom line you are aiming to meet uh, with your project with your projects or programs, because it can make a difference um, when you look at what the what the problem uh, should be, uh, mm -hmm. the problem and the solution. Is it productivity? That's internal efficiency. Uh, that we also have in the private sector, but what we don't have necessarily is the, the democracy bottom line. Is it transparent? Uh, is it uh, helping uh, citizens to uh, to feel more engaged in the processes? This is something that I stole from Dave Snowden from Cognitive Edge in the UK, and it's actually very useful in terms of the problem definition. Because if you look at the, it this way, that simple problems uh, are the ones that, uh, that we have the best practices for, and we can actually replicate that one solution and apply it to another uh, problem. Then we have the complicated problems uh, where experts can be helpful in solving them. Um, Snowden uses the example of a Ferrari that uh, is broken, and you need an expert to uh, to um, to fix it, but you know that there's a problem, just that you can't solve it on your own. Very often, we treat public sector problems as complicated, when they are actually, in fact, complex. And that means that we may have to get a lot more knowledge about what the problem actually is um, than we do if it's just a variety that we can uh, uh, get an expert to fix. Um, and then we have finding the chaotic problems that we don't uh, analyze on but act on, like for instance terrorism or uh, natural disasters and stuff like this. So my point with this slide is that if we want to fix the right problem, we need to recognize that we have to move from here to here in our understanding of the problems. To us that means to go out there and look at it, and uh, to go very close up before you zoom out and redesign what it actually is that you want to do. The other day we were talking about theories of, of change. You need to define not what the solution is, but what change you want to see in the world with the project that you do. And that's actually hard for civil servants. Civil servants are very used to having already the solution at hand before even starting their projects. If you knew how many times we've been approached with, you know, can MindLab help us do this campaign? Or can MindLab help us uh, do this or that? That we already know what the solution is and we just have to work towards that goal. That's not how we work. We want a move from public authorities delivering service to citizens. So instead a situation where we actually can create the new solutions with people, not only for them. 
this means, and I'll come back to this, this means that we also have to take into account that public sector solutions don't hit a ground zero. Something is already there, and we need to take that into account when we create the new solutions. And very often we don't do that. Very often we invent something from new, and then hope that it will function when we implement it. Yes, this is our uh, process model, um, and um, we have had several over the years. So this is our newest process model. Um, but basically, they all show the same thing, that we uh, spoke the project and we, and we spent quite some time in this phase uh, of uh, problem definition. And we do that by uh, doing the field research with citizens, businesses, or whoever are the stakeholders in the project to understand the problem. And then we come back and have a, a lot of insights that we, need to, uh, that we need to work with in different ways so we can engage stakeholders uh, and eventually citizens in the process of coming up with new solutions over here. And then the testing and maybe an iteration uh, if uh, it's not hitting target the first time. You can say it's a broader scope of people that we actually want to go out there to uh, get new knowledge, first-hand knowledge, and also a different kind of process that we use to uh, in the public sector. Another way of putting it is, you know, we want to combine the two. So we want to both have the more holistic uh, knowledge uh, and also stand on the shoulders of what's already there of knowledge in the systems. So what do you do uh, when you have all this material um, and you want to engage stakeholders in the process of ideation? So one thing could be in very simple forms to, for instance, uh, mark up the, the blueprint of the existing system. I know this is in Danish, um, but uh, I can tell you what it is. It's actually just a systems map before creating a user journey through the system. This is from one of our very first projects uh, with uh, injured people who had uh, injuries at work. So they had a case to get the compensation with the National Board of Injuries. And having that, you uh, came in, in touch with so many different uh, stakeholders, like uh, doctors, employers, insurance companies, private clinics, the municipality, unions, and, and uh, the people going through a process like this um, actually had a lot of pain points. This is a user journey from, from a citizen like that. She got so much mail that uh, it actually became pain points for her. And it was mail from all these different stakeholders, uh, not coordinated um, and not always really important but just for her to know how the case was progressing. And that meant that she didn't know what was important and what was not, and she ended up keeping everything, and that was literally physically show me the, and show me the, and show me the paper uh, in her home. Um, and of course, when you have a service journey like this, the important thing is the, to uh, is the touch points, where, of course, the point of pain, but also maybe even in the beginning, can we do something different in the beginning that prevents this from happening uh, at all? And if not, can we do something about uh, the, the pain points uh, in this journey? Service journeys are very useful for ideation because it's actually quite simple to look at and to see, okay, who of these different stakeholders could benefit from working together at a very early point. But also, where are the lower hanging fruits? Can we do something immediately? And what is longer term uh, change, even systemic change um, that we need to look at? This is another journey. It's not a service journey. This is um, the journey, my club's journey. And um, I brought this not because you should read it, because you can, but just to show you that we have been trying to also learn from what we've done ourselves. And 
this is meant to show that we are not actually focusing exactly the same way as we did in the beginning because we focused mainly on service design and service improvements when we started out. So actually improving services. Later on, it became more and more complex issues like policy issues, uh, educational reforms, uh, reform of disability on the dis disabled people on the labor market, stuff like this, so more complicated and more national matters instead of local services. Um, and also, we have been working with uh, different strategic partners over the years. For instance, the Ministry of Interior, who uh, were looking to do a modernization reform of the public sector and had us do some modernization labs within uh, the, the between regions, municipalities, and state to see how could we improve services that was linked between all of these different stakeholders. So we spent some time doing that, and then all of a sudden, it, uh, the notion of design in public sector took off as an international movement as well. So a lot of people started coming to us and ask questions, and all of a sudden we found ourselves also working with, for instance, you guys in different parts of the world, mainly though in the Eurasian region, uh, who were looking also to apply all sorts of different types of uh, approaches, not only to their own work, but also in, in uh, the local country offices and in their council and within local governments. And that's, for instance, the potential that I see uh, for you guys, that you can actually uh, not only do something about your own organization, but you also have the, the means to, to bring this uh, to countries that are already looking at how to develop uh, their own capacity in so many ways. I would say that moving on to more complex issues like reform making processes and the like, um, this also means that we have to also look at the systemic impact of the different solutions that we come up with. Because naturally, when you look at how should we optimally create uh, every form, what should that process look like, then it will, of course, uh, have some consequences on the systems uh, that we work in. They need to take on new processes uh, and to um, engage in that paradigm shift. We had the chance uh, over the last three, four years to be part of quite a few uh, reform processes. Our former government was very reform eager, and uh, within our circle of, of uh, owners and funders, we had uh, a lot of reforms that we could do that. And that made us uh, um, engage in different phases of reform making processes. Very lovely to be part of the entire process and also look at how can we actually um, build in implementation very early on in these uh, reform making processes. Because we saw time after time how reforms, when they hit the ground, actually didn't reach the intended political effects. And we asked ourselves the question, how can we make that happen, or how can we make it more likely to happen? And one of the answers would, of course, be that we need to build in implementation in the very beginning of these processes to understand how will this reform work when it hits reality out there. Again, it's not ground zero out there, so we need to know what's already there. What can we build on? Um, specifically, it meant um, in the disabled uh, employment reform, it meant that a team of uh, very central uh, civil servants went to uh, to the front level to see what was already there and also to see how could the potential new reform actually play out uh, when we implemented it. So it was about doing some um, doing some small scale field work in the beginning for them to learn before they even put a pen to the paper and, and sat down and wrote it up. And then also, you know, moving that back into the same circle if we saw something that didn't work. So it was basically also looking at how tightly knit should the reform actually be. Uh, if, we, if we create them uh, very finished, then the space for adjustments uh, become uh, equally smaller. 
So that was a bit about our journey. Um, I talked about the non bubble but also the partnering with the service recipients. Um, let me go back to this one. That's uh, also the, um, the pamphlets that I put on the table. It's about uh, not only co-creation, but also how can we sometimes build in uh, other resources around people into the solutions. And that's the move from co-creation to co-production. So how could we, in the case of the Indian people, if, for instance, build on the fact that we learned that uh, a lot of these people got their advices from friends and families. This is not only the case in, in this case. It's very often the case that people get their uh, knowledge from uh, their own surroundings. And that can be really bad advice, and that can actually uh, obstruct processes that are in place uh, from, from the public sector side. So how can we make that a, a constructive partner in the solution making? How can we, for instance, inform those people to be able to give the right advice? So that's about uh, partnering with, um, with people around um, the stakeholders that are, are part of the bigger picture. How can we build those in? to the solution making and that can be both in very small scale services but also on, on the larger uh, policy areas. Um, I'm guessing that someone will ask about um, resistance in systems towards this and um, of course we've seen resistance but I'm not a big fan of the narrative that the, um, that the public sector per se is not able to change or is very uh, um, inflexible. Uh, rather, I'm a fan of the narrative that you can actually change a lot by talking to people, telling about new approaches, but also show, showing what it can do for them. So if you build up uh, results with people instead of just doing it for them, then they will also get their hands on uh, own experiences of what this can do for their results. And people actually, believe it or not, like to create better results, like to learn uh, how to do stuff differently. So um, somehow, I don't know if I'm being a bit Route, but I feel that that narrative that the public sector is uh, unable to change uh, and inflexible, that that is the easy way, way out. I mean, that it's very easy to say, no, that can't be done here because we are the public sector and we are so inflexible and we are risk avert and uh, all this stuff. Yes, it's true, but yet again, it's, it's only people working in these organizations. And most of us go to work every day to do a good job, to create a better world. And, and uh, that also goes for the rest of the people in these organizations. So it's a matter of engaging in that dialogue and taking the discussion and asking ourselves, how can we do better? Service design is not necessarily the only way of doing this. There are lots of different new approaches out there that could be tested out. And I guess that the next step from here is to learn from as organizations how to how to uh, apply the right approach to the right problem. I don't have the answer to that yet, but it's an interesting discussion to engage in. How can we learn to become better at picking uh, the right tools instead of just doing what we're used to doing? So another ongoing discussion is where should we put innovation to form? Should it be a lab? Should it be innovation facility? Should it be? Uh, should it not be something just existing within the, the systems? Um, I don't have the one right answer to that either. But my only experience, of course, is from being uh, in an internal lab, and the asset of that has been to us to be able to work with people as colleagues in these ministries, municipalities, so that we can actually be part of the process from very early on until it's already implemented and we need and in the need of adjustment and feedback loops uh, to uh, 
um, to do better. And that we couldn't have done had we been on the outside, I would claim. But of course, I also know of uh, excellent uh, external units doing a very good job. A very good example is the behavioral insights unit that started out as an internal unit and now spun out and became uh, an external unit, still working with a lot of the same partners. And that seems to go really well uh, also. Then the following discussion, um, and it's already beginning, is okay, do we need labs at all? Uh, should we not have uh, these capabilities within the organizations um, to, uh, to not need uh, to be supported? Um, and yes, that would be very nice. Um, I'm not sure we are there yet, but I am sure that uh, ultimately, in the best of all worlds, a unit like my lab would be redundant. We had this, this discussion the other day, and, and you said um, that it shouldn't be to become redundant because there would also always be a need for change, and that's a good point. But yet, I mean, if you want to uh, apply approaches like this and skills like this to organizations, you should aim for it to be a part of the organization and not something that you uh, have something a little more fancy out here to uh, help you do. Because I mean, it's uh, it should be inherent um, in, in, in the organizations. And until then, then of course we all need to look around us and learn from what other people are doing. That's how we become better. Um, and that was actually it for now. Thank you very much, uh, Kip. That was, that was very interesting, and I know you have a lot of uh, very um, pointed um, examples that you can also, uh, you could take us through for each one of the journeys, service journeys that you've been facilitating. Perhaps some of that will come out uh, in the discussion. Um, I think, you know, uh, for us, as we look at all this material, one of the challenges is to think, you know, what is the next step for an organization like UNDP? highly decentralized with different offices, different programs. One of the things we like to do with the facility is to is to promote and, and support those offices that are uh, almost self-starters. They want to try new things. They have a portfolio and a remit. Uh, there may be crisis office. There may be offices going through uh, important transitions. We have colleagues around the room here today that have done some of this work already on the ground. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that not all of it is, is really new for us. In fact, we've been at it for a number of years, and we've been uh, stealing with pride from different outfits, including uh, my lab, uh, in terms of the techniques. Uh, maybe we should just open it up for discussion, see what immediate reactions we have. And I also don't want to forget about our friends and colleagues who are online on Google, uh, on, on the Google Hangout. So maybe, uh, I would, um, Raquel, you can flag us if, if there's any specific questions they have for us. Thank you. Let's just throw it open, maybe. Any immediate feedback or questions? Please, sir, go ahead. Um, hello, uh, thank you very much for the great presentation. I think it's very inspiring when you hear you know, the new approaches and new techniques uh, that I think that be applicable. Uh, my name is Jose Cruzo Soria with the Policy Bureau, and I work with the responsible accountable institutions uh, team. So we deal a lot with public sector reform, and certainly I uh, hear um, yeah, my, my question, and I wanted to get some of your insight into this, is that uh, you are, as you say, you, you must bring many stakeholders to the process. So when you're dealing with uh, uh, public sector institutional reform, especially in the service delivery or the regulatory reform, you are involving, obviously, uh, many, many uh, levels of the bureaucracy uh, from different department ministries to the uh, to the parliament, uh, the lawmakers, and, uh, and so uh, and that's just uh, not to take into account of the actual um, citizens and those that are to which the service has to be delivered. But in the bureaucracy, uh, yes, there is a lot of resistance. Um, and, and my question has to do more with how do you think that you bring them into the process? Because there are usually uh, they are used to their own system, their own approach. The, uh, and, and how is it that we can you know, uh, get them engaged that they actually are, are co-creators, co-designers, uh, and, and buy into this uh, mind-not type of approach rather than trying to uh, 
uh, you know, to follow the traditional route of how things are done. Uh, you spoke a little bit about it, but I'm more curious about you know, this, this great panoply of actors from the bureaucracy. How is it that you actually engage them so that they they buy into it and are active uh, voters of that type of project process? Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, I guess it's a matter of both engaging in the in the conversation with them, with the actual policymakers, but also make them be part of the doing. So, in the case of, for instance, the disability reform, uh, it was very low practical actually going to the front level and having them spend some time there to for themselves see what goes on and for themselves see what. The reality, the reform, the reform that they were to write, actually uh, had to exist in, and that's um, a very, uh, you could call it a very banal step, but it didn't happen before, and they were actually uh, quite enthused to see uh, what it was like at the front level, because very often that doesn't happen, that you actually get out there and see for yourself uh, what um, what happens and how for instance, the new solution would meet that reality. So that was one thing. Uh, another thing was to uh, start this conversation at a broader level, also within the Ministry of Employment, and then eventually implement this new type of process uh, in that ministry. So it wasn't a, a change that happened overnight, but, uh, but they did end up implementing this process in the entire ministry, including agencies, having a large uh, management uh, conference with this only uh, as the topic, how do we meet uh, the intended political effects? So I guess it's about you know both starting the, the discussion, pointing to what is needed, but also showing the central people what needs to be done uh, by having them look for themselves. I don't, did I answer your question? Uh, yes. Um but uh, I guess, because for me, you know, usually the front, uh, front line uh, civil servants who uh, deliver the service, I think it's, uh, in my experience, it's very easy to engage them. Because they are, they know the, what works, what doesn't work. But it's more of the level of the more senior management policy makers, their, you know, their superiors, who uh, usually are, you know, I, I probably maybe don't have an understanding of patients of time more. Uh, with commitment to invest in this type of, uh, of approach. And, and I'm just wondering what, the, what have you found? Is I guess that I guess we were also helped by that there was a broader agenda upcoming around implementation. So it was something that was uh, spoken about in, within the central administration. How do we become better at implementation? So there was some sort of momentum for us to bring something to that discussion. Um, and also, I mean, you are so right because usually we would just say we have created this reform package. We even called it that reform packages, and now we deliver it to the front level and just let go and hope for the best. So we, it was pretty obvious that we needed to look at that link and not only uh, let go, but also look at how could it actually work out there. Uh, it's very common to spend quite some time on writing up the reform and very give very little time for the actual implementation of it. Yes, you have a second question. Hi, I'm Faisa. I'm from uh, UNDP's Asia Pacific Bureau. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, you know, I have a question. Um, and your last slide actually triggered it. Uh, and it was uh, talking about... Uh, about Mind Lab and where does it go from here? Uh, and this is an issue which UNDP is confronted with in many of its work at country office level about how do we sustain sort of these little pilots right. of innovation that we have. And uh, not just sustain, sustain, but in fact upscale yeah. them. Uh, and that's one of our biggest challenges. And if I looked at Mind Lab, let's say a little as a project, right, of the day of, the, uh, of your government. The question now is, how does Mind Lab continue? 
does it mean does it stay part of the government does it become an independent entity and then the bottom line over here i mean it may not maybe many other bottom lines but one that i see of great relevance is about who is going to fund this you know right now it is it is the commitment of your government uh, but then uh, even in country offices the question is who will support this beyond let's say UNDP or a handful of two offices mm -hmm. and i want to get a sense from you i mean based on the, on mind labs uh, right now introspective thinking that's going on uh, where do you see yourself going do you see being able to uh, to continue your services on a fee basis uh, like another one of your companies that you mentioned it uh, it shot off on its own and is doing very well mm -hmm. do you see that there would is a demonstrated demand on a, on a, and also based on in a capacity and a willingness to pay for your services so that you could be completely be independent and you could in fact you know scale it up and go big or do you st see, still see being uh, being part of the government and 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 then trying to change from within? So I'd like to hear from you. On that. Very good questions. Um, as I mentioned, I see it as a big asset to be on the inside because you can be there much more longer term, be part of the processes both earlier and later than uh, many externals can. So I would say that that's, uh, that's something that, that uh, um, would be nice to continue. Um, but also, I mean, many private uh, consultancies have taken this up. So it is possible to buy it uh, somewhere else now. Uh, and that's only a good thing. I mean, competition never hurts. And, um, and also, it's a way of scaling it. Right, that more people take it up, and and uh, we should be happy that that's mm -hmm. happening. Um, what I see uh, right now, the the direction we're moving is very much on capacity building within organizations, within the people, uh, the organizations that we work with, uh, like you have also done in in UNDP. I mean, one of the best examples I have seen on. Um, on actually identifying innovators in your own organization, supporting them in a in the best possible manner, with also external advice, uh, com uh, combining the right people with the right problems. That was the work in the Eurasian region that was highly experimental, but also they actually uh, did establish that network of innovators that so many of us are discussing right now. How can that be done? And my only good example is, is uh, what you've done. So you also do some of this stuff yourself and, and can learn from it also when you look to, for scalability. Of course, you can take that exact solution or way of doing it and apply it to a different region, but you can become inspired and find your own model. Um, in terms of who should fund it, I would like to think that um, that proven results along the way will get you the funding that you need for projects like this. I know it's a fluffy answer, but <laughs> anyway, but you need to stand on the shoulders of examples already there. And, and I guess on this count, it's a very, very relevant question for UNDP. We're sort of going through a lot of soul searching. How do we, what's a real our next, our next iteration uh, in this vastly changing landscape? This, in this very constrained financial environment. I think part of the answer and part of what we certainly aspire to do is to provide different models of service provision, including what UNDP does vis-a-vis -vis governments. Um, I think it's unrealistic to expect uptake uh, immediately. Um, uh, if you look at, at the rest of the organization, what we hear is that you know, it could take up to a decade, really, to get through that transformation, where there's a proof of concept is taken up as, as, a, as a seriously built up and resourced. Um, obviously, but, but it's important to start now. I, I think it is. And thinking of, of starting, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned capacity building. Uh, it's almost ironic that we've sort of done away with that term within the organization. But truly, that was and is the, uh, the capacity building element is, 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 is the key offering that, that we do day in, day out at, at country level, region level, headquarters level. Whether we call it that anymore or not, it does not matter. And, and, and 
you know, we put emphasis sometimes on the word innovation. It can be a bit of a buzzword. But really, a lot of this builds on a tradition of capacity building over the years. And we've been at that. And it's almost time to, to resurrect and go, go back to that proud past and say, how, how do we put this forward now in this, in this rapidly changing uh, environment? Hopefully, with the, um, with the donor uh, goodwill that we've had over the last couple of years, we have been able to at least show some good examples of uptake. It's one of our key indicators in the innovation facility. Um, and when we speak, say, to Ramia in, in Asia Pacific, this is one of the things we discuss all the time. Where can we find something that helps us make the case for uptake? And, and it doesn't have to be around a, 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 um, a, you know, a, a service journey type. It could, be, uh, it could be some other area of innovation. But that's certainly the most important single uh, indicator uh, that we have. Sometimes we may have to force that a little bit in terms of saying let, let's uh, let's try as much as we can to leverage the resources we have. We have a fairly complex internal resource allocation structure uh, and, and try and see to what extent can we commit our own resources instead of just relying on some of this external outlier type, type input. And that could be a way to try and see how much, what places we can have uh, more will and investment to provide that safe space for, for experimentation. Uh, it's not an easy answer, though. And, and, and of course, mine is fluffier than yours, but uh, it's still around. But just to say that I think it, it's very, it, it is very perceptive. It is that scalability, that sustainability element that uh, will take a little while to, to build up. But it's a way to start. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, yes. Maybe uh, yes. can, oh, can I just add to that? Because also, it's not only a matter of of funding. I know funding is important, but it's also a matter of feeling motivated to take on a project like this. And you, you of course, won't do that if you don't feel the support of, of the organization. And that's the first baby steps to actually feel that it is wanted um, and that it's allowed to do experimentation. And then just a little seed money can actually be that motivation factor that will get uh, stuff started. And Thank you. Maybe I'll turn it over to Sharif from our Egypt office, because it's very fortunate to have him here. He's a real practitioner of all these things, uh, with Jennifer's support over the last um, year or so. So welcome again. It's great to be here. Thank you. Go Hi. ahead. My name is Sharif from the NDP, uh, Egypt office. Uh, also, back to your question, I think it depends on the service from the innovation lab. I think if it's within the government, then once the government shows the result or shows the result to the government and show it, I think this should be funded from the government. You cannot go and take it from private sector and fund public service uh, reform. And uh, uh, so, from our experience also in Egypt, we have several activities that usually incubated as. UNDP project and then, then spin off and the government take over and uh, put funds on this. On the other side, it is the innovation lab related to the community work and others, like what we have it in Egypt. Usually, it's easy to, be, to get funds from the private sector. So, uh, for instance, we started the, our innovation lab uh, one, one year ago, and now we start getting some funds from either private sector or through uh, big NGOs uh, in Egypt. Please. Thanks for watching. Jeff, go ahead. I'm going to ask the attorney, do you want to ask the question? We caught you right in time. Okay. I'm from Nickland. I, I, I work with uh, Arab States, uh, Bureau, and um, uh, thank you so much for a very inspiring presentation. And uh, Jennifer is really helping us to really uh, convince um, our colleagues in the region, also the government in the region, to to understand that innovation is not uh, the luxury, but it's really a necessity. So um, I have two questions. Two questions. One is, I understand your mind lab is the longest living public sector innovation lab. Longest you, living. Longest living. <laughs> it's not a living dead. It's it. a living alive. Yeah, if you could possibly mention three critical elements. What made your lab so successful? Also, as in the uh, you know the Swiss statistic, um, you could mention elements. And also, two second question: um, Arab states, of course, include so many fragile countries, um, countries in transition, sometimes post-conflict. Um, how how would you apply differently? How differently would you apply your model in such a country? 
interesting because I understand your country has such a very well established system already in place. Yeah. So in, in the fragile countries, would you apply to the country if you work with us and what would be your advice? Okay, to take the, the last question first, um, that's actually something that uh, the work with uh, you guys have learned us how how that could work. Because we one of uh, the interactions we've had with UNDP was uh, working with service design in Moldova, uh, looking at how that could work in, in, a, in a rather different setting uh, than Denmark. And that turned out to be a surprisingly uh, success uh, and te uh, teased us how th that could be done and what benefits could come from that. For instance, in minimizing corruption, uh, service journeys and touch points came out to, to be a, a really good tool for visualizing the many touch points uh, possible uh, for stuff like that. So uh, to my pleasure, I have seen it applied in many different settings than, than our own. Um, and of course, uh, we have yet to see it all, but uh, I think that I wouldn't, as a point of departure, do anything differently. But then again, maybe adjust uh, to the local setting as you learn from, from doing it. Your other question, what has made the success? Uh, I actually did some research on that, um, and, and there are, of course, many elements in combination. Um, but one of them, one of things that I found was actually, you know, people meaning it. So everybody uh, at MindLab means this. They want this to happen. And that means that uh, there's some sort of really high, uh, high scale engagement uh, in spreading the news. That's one. And then a consistency in what uh, is being said and what is being done. So if you say we want to change a lot and you don't do anything about it, then people will stop believing what you say. That's simple. Mm -hmm. uh, those are just a couple of the elements. But also uh, that we have been a learning organization. And I guess that's possibly the most important fact, that we ourselves have, have learned and moved on, uh, taken on uh, the learnings and, and really incorporated them in the next step that we took. So um, so that's really important, to be able to change yourself. Thank you. Thank you for that. Do we have any takers? And Great. Maybe I can just wrap it off also in, in terms of uh, the fact that we have uh, Jennifer Miles and, and Gina from other agencies and, and, and from Delco, our coordination outfit. I think there's a lot of learning here in terms of some of the processes we go through as UN organizations. Think about UNDA, for instance. It would be nice to have some kind of alternative pathway, if you will, to develop some of these documents that do require a lot of thinking, a lot of analysis, a lot of synthesis, and a lot of understanding of, of around comparative advantage and pain points. It's a, it's a really painful journey for all of us who have been through some of these um, documents at particular country level. So I think there's a lot of learning there as well for us in that respect. Uh, and, um, and and that's for another day. But uh, but thank you, Kit. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being here today for this interesting session. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. So we're going to be doing your Yes, yes.